Well, that's quite an introduction. I hope you all will come to 255 a week from Saturday night. I'm going to be there, and I've asked a lot of my friends to join me, and we'll have a good time together. Yes, that's right. Uh, I've been at Gordon for a few years, as uh, we've heard from Greg this morning. But now it's time for Mrs. Carlberg and me to transition from Gordon. So this is a transition year for us, and uh, we'll be stepping away uh, on June 30th. Now, what led us to make that decision? Well, actually, believe it or not, the, the class of 2011 had a lot to do with it. Let me show you why. Do you recognize that T-shirt? Here it is. Here it is. And uh, the class gave us that shirt last spring. And we thought, well, well, we'll take it to heart. Because you see what it says on the... <laughs> right there. Go 2011. It became very clear to us. <laughs> And then I turned the shirt around, and I saw this. Now, I was concerned about that because it looks like it came right from Wheaton College. That's their colors. That, look, that looks like their seal. I thought, oh, my goodness. By the way, whatever happened to those T-shirts? I haven't seen any <laughs> recently. Maybe they caught on that uh, that was confusing to people to have a Wheaton T-shirt at Gordon College. But yes, we're going through transition, and uh, we will join the class of 2011 as they go through transition. Last, last year at commencement, uh, we gave the class of 2010 this little, the message. And uh, we also gave them a bookmark to put into the message. Uh, on one side, it had a quote from James, chapter 1, 5, 6. If you don't know what you're doing, pray to the Father. He loves to help. You'll get his help and won't be condescended to when you ask for it. Ask boldly, believing without a second thought. And then on the other side, it had the scripture that we just had read for us this morning from Romans 12, 1 and 2. And I'd like to focus this morning on that scripture a little bit as uh, we... Consider what it means to live in everyday holiness. I'm going to share with you some learning from ordinary life. And uh, that, that learning has to do with things that have impacted me uh, through the years and impacted my wife. One of the things that we look forward to doing when we finally step away from Gordon College is spending some time with our grandchildren. And some others... Other things are uh, going to come along too, but we love our grandchildren. We have four and another one due any day, so we'll have five by the time we wrap it up here. And this morning, instead of speaking to you as the president of Gordon College, I'd kind of like to speak to you as a grandparent, a person who has learned some things in life that I'd like to share from you, uh, with you. And they come essentially from my reading of Romans chapter 12. I'll be focusing on uh, the verses there. The bookmark that uh, we gave to the class reminds us, and Romans 12 reminds us too, that uh, we have a responsibility in our lives. Uh, we can't dump all of the things that go on on God. We can't blame Him. The uh, passage says, don't get squeezed into the mold of the dominant culture. Fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. And so my first learning from ordinary life is live the reflective life. We have messages that crowd into our lives every day. Even as I was preparing my, my remarks at my laptop the other day, every few minutes another ding would occur on the computer telling me that a message came in and I needed to respond to it. And then there would be a little bell that went off to tell me that 
in an hour I had to be at this meeting. Uh, we, you all live with that. You have your cell phones, you have all of your social media uh, signals and so on. We live with that constantly. We face these distractions that keep us from deeper relationships with each other and from growing in our walk with God. Researchers are examining your subculture. They call it the emerging adult. And they, they tell us that you indeed want to keep spirituality alive in your, in your experience. You want to know God. Um, but um, perhaps it's different from the way your parents did or your grandparents do. As a matter of fact, uh, Christian Smith, Dr. Christian Smith, who is now a professor at the University of Notre Dame, has written a book called Souls in Transition. And he details over a, a long period of time what he has found in studying the emergent adult from age 18 to age 29. And uh, I read an article recently in the Boston Globe uh, by a faculty member at BU who uh, had read some of the work that Christian Smith did. He's a graduate of Gordon. He's, he's uh, probably the foremost scholar on spirituality and young people today. And here's what this BU professor said, talking about your generation. They care about things of the spirit, and they are eager to vote and to volunteer. They are suspicious, however, of large cookie cutter organizations that want to corral and, and brand them. Do they trust people over 30? Absolutely. They just don't want to join their clubs, their political parties, or their churches. They don't want a place at the table. They want a chat room of their own. Remember last year when we had that techno fast on campus? Uh, for those of you who are new to Gordon, the techno fast was a weekend, about three days, when we all said, okay, we're not going to be locked into the, uh, the computers, we're not going to be locked into our cell phones, to the various social networks. We're going to turn it all off, and we're going to see what happened. And, and indeed, the sound was deafening. The silence was deafening. You had more time for relationship building. You had more time for reading. You told us this. We had a whole convocation on it last year. You had time to hang out with friends. Your pace slowed. And you had time with God. And that was a refreshing experience for all of us on campus. Mrs. Carlberg and I recently took a time out, uh, which we do periodically to replenish and refresh. And we uh, went to a, a place in the mountains that uh, we had made available to us for a week. We took our Bibles, we took some books to read, we took our notebooks, and we just hung out. We tried not to have anything intrude into our, into our lives. And we found peace, we found shalom, which in the Hebrew means wholeness or well-being or perfection or flourishing. And uh, that's what we found. And we also found an opportunity to make some decisions about this coming year and to solidify in our own minds that it was time for us to step aside. So I say to you, be reflective. Live the reflective life. Find time to spend with God and spend in his word. Allow the Holy Spirit to inform your decisions. Don't let God be squeezed out of your lives. And now that brings me to the, the second uh, point that I'd like to make to die, today. Write down your goals. Now that may sound strange. Write down your goals. Why do I say that? Well, I think in many ways the Apostle Paul in writing the book of Romans was, was indeed writing down some things for the churches, especially the Romans, but he was also writing some things to remind himself of what it meant to be a godly person, a person who related to Jesus Christ. And so we can read 21 centuries later what he wrote, and it still can inform us because he wrote it down. Mrs. Carlberg and I have uh, each developed the habit of carrying a notebook with blank pages. And whenever we think of an important idea, we each write it down and uh, our ideas eventually will grow into goals. And I'll transfer mine into uh, my, my laptop so I can keep track of it 
uh, on a regular basis. Now, Mrs. Carlberg is averse to doing that. So she does something much more creative. And if you open her notebook at Christmas time, you'll see that each line is a different color. It's red, and then it's green, and then it's red, and it's green. And it has, uh, when I come in at Christmas and see her drinking coffee in the morning, she's, she's going through her day. Each, each hour or each 30 minutes is broken down, one of those lines. And then up in the corners will be a holly wreath that he, she puts in there. Uh, or or at, if it's Valentine's, there's a heart. There are hearts all over the pages. Now, let me, we all smile about that, but the reality is that Mrs. Carlberg, because she writes down things like that and has goals, is able to accomplish a tremendous amount of activity and task and goal completion in her life. She's an inspiration to me because sometimes I try to carry it around in my head, and, and I, you know that? I can lose some of that, too. Uh, did you know that actually writing down a goal has been shown to increase the likelihood of accomplishing the goal by over 50%? When I first came to Gordon, we launched a faculty development program. And uh, the faculty uh, got together and said, OK, what's going to make this a better place? Well, we'll start with ourselves we'll begin to put together a growth contract. And uh, in that growth contract, we'll lay out the things that we want to accomplish each year. Actually, the faculty is still doing that today. And you know what happened as they wrote down their goals? Teaching improved. More research was done. The quality of teaching was, uh, was very, very markedly uh, obvious. Uh, their, their satisfaction as professional faculty members increased, and uh, they focused on encouraging and rewarding each other because each one who wrote a plan did it in cooperation with others that came around them and encouraged them as they attempted to fulfill their plan. In the long run, that became a national program that was emulated by colleges and universities around the country. And that basic concept of writing things down to improve professional life and personal life has permeated uh, many colleges and universities throughout the United States. Now, you may ask, uh, how does this fit into Romans 12? Well, uh, I believe that Paul had in his mind the idea that, that there were a lot of things that needed to be written down for the church to, to follow if they were going to become deeply spiritual, committed people in their lives and if they were going to be able to carry out what the Holy Spirit had prompted uh, in, in the Apostle Paul's thinking. And he also, as I said before, was teaching uh, things to himself and reminding himself of what it meant to be a godly person. This leads me to the third learning in ordinary life. Embrace the big world. Romans 12 says, take what you are learning in your everyday ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. Take what you're learning at Gordon College and place it before God as an offering. Embrace the big world. Become comfortable with people whose views aren't the same as yours. People whose commitments and values are not necessarily Christian. People who need to hear the compelling case for Jesus Christ making a difference in your life and in, in their lives. One of the best decisions of my life was to, uh, after completing my undergraduate work and, and seminary degree, to go to a major university, Michigan State University. And uh, I spent almost a decade there uh, with Jan and with uh, our children who came along while we were at Michigan State. Now, why was that a great decision? Well, it made me get engaged with a lot of people with whom I, I did not agree in terms of their religious views or their values or their commitments. But I had to learn how to relate to them. I made it a, a goal in, in, uh, at Michigan State not to go into a cocoon, not to be uh, threatened by this environment that was very challenging, but instead to volunteer for faculty committees to 
uh, apply to work in the president's office, to get to know the president of the university, to talk about spiritual things with him, uh, to, uh, to simply commit myself to relating to others with whom I found um, a, a commonality, but not a common value base and a common uh, uh, spiritual uh, foundation. I learned to, in essence, embrace a big world. And uh, those learnings that I got at Michigan State have been able to inform me throughout the rest of my life, even here at Gordon College. And now today, I have the opportunity of, of influencing uh, higher education in a broader sense as a Christian. And I'm known as a Christian uh, in, in Washington, D.C., in government and in accreditation matters, in the business community here in Boston or even beyond, or in church and theological issues, uh, education, uh, where, where I serve uh, Denver Seminary on the board of, of trustees there. I think that that is a motivation for me to be able to prepare myself to go out even today and to learn new things, meet new people, and, and uh, be an example of what a Christian ought to be in uh, the larger world. I learned about uh, aspiring to a, a bigger world at Michigan State. I've carried it on here at, at uh, Gordon College. And I also learned that we could be much more effective at Gordon if we made available some of the programs that would take us away from the campus, for, take students away from campus to uh, other parts of the world or to the inner cities of our nation or, or to rural areas in poverty, and to let our students be face-to-face -face with the experiences of newness and challenge and questioning and, and difficulty. And this is what I would urge for you, that you would have an opportunity to embrace the big new world through travel and study. We're still learning to embrace the new world. Just two weeks ago, two of our trustees invited Jan and me to attend the Oxford Analytica 27th Annual Oxford uh, International Conference in Oxford, England, obviously. And uh, we, were, we, we were trying to get to this conference for years, and it always conflicted with our Board of Trustees meeting. This year, it worked out. And so, uh, as their guests, we went to the Oxford Analytic Conference. The, uh, this is the, uh, the Youngs uh, on the right-hand side of the picture that you see there. Uh, they are both people who have served Gordon College as trustees, and they both founded Oxford Analytica 27 years ago. What's the purpose of the conference? It's to bring together leaders from all over the world. Uh, there were about 100 participants there from 28 countries. Some were in business, some were in government, some were in politics, uh, and some were in the finance world and banking and so on. But they came together to be briefed by Oxford Dons about the crucial issues that are facing us in the 21st century, and in particular in this year of 2010. Some of the things that, uh, they, that we uh, were briefed on during the three days we were there was healthcare innovation. Is it a necessary investment or is, is cost containment the answer to health care? Our balance of power, is, is it changing for the good or is there evil coming? Capitalism, what's it for? The under 30s, you people for, by and large, how will they shape the world? And you know, as I listened to the Dons, as I asked questions, I felt myself having a much broader perspective on on the responsibility of a Christian in today's world. But I had another thought, and that is, how can I get Gordon students to think big and to think about this kind of exposure in their own lives so that they, too, can have an impact on the world going forward? Lift your sights. Grow at Gordon. But don't stop there. A.J. Gordon founded Gordon College 175 years ago this year, and we're celebrating his 100, I'm sorry, he founded the college 121 years ago. We're celebrating his birthday 175 years ago this year. And he saw a big need in his world. The whole motivation for 
building Gordon College was to be able to reach out to a world that needed Jesus Christ. And he wanted to prepare students to proclaim Jesus Christ to the world. That was his motivation. But he also, at the same time, had values about social justice, about equality, about uh, providing for the poor, about addressing the rampant problem of alcoholism in his day. And we're still in the same business of preparing students here at, at Gordon. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to, uh, to run into Boston uh, at, at lunchtime and meet with a Gordon alumnus, Dr. Don Gonzalez. And Dr. Gonzalez was in Boston because uh, one of the largest medical conventions in the country, in the world, literally, was happening at the Boston Convention Center. So he invited me to come in to see what his work is all about. He's a Gordon graduate in 1996. He went on to get a, master, uh, uh, a medical degree, and um, then he went into a specialty of uh, ears, eyes, no, I'm sorry, uh, ears, nose, and throat uh, uh, treatments, and uh, became a surgeon. And in the process of doing his surgery, he realized that uh, he, he could make instruments that were very delicate and could do a better job of helping people to uh, successfully pass through surgery, to heal quicker, and with less, uh, less traumatic, traumatic impact on their lives. And as he stood there telling me this, I, I, he was so excited. He just was showing me this and showing me that and, and uh, saying, do you know how many hundreds of people, thousands of people now, are having this very delicate surgery using our instruments? It's, it's just so wonderful. And I said to him, Don, how did Gordon College make a difference in your life? And he thought for just a second, and he said, oh, that's where it all began. I, I began in the labs with Dr. Camp, learning the basics of the human body. And I learned from him the importance of creativity and thinking outside the box, of improving scientific research. He said, Gordon College made all the difference in my world. And I urge you today to have the experience that, that Don Gonzalez had of letting Gordon College and our faculty and our staff build a firm foundation for you for life. Take what you are learning at Gordon in your everyday, ordinary life and place it before God as an offering. Live a reflective life Write down your goals. Live in the big world. This is Oxford. I hope some of you someday will, will study at Christ Church in Oxford. I hope that you'll eat your meals in the Great Hall there, which is famous now around the world because it's where uh, Harry Potter uh, was filmed. Uh, and uh, in fact, thousands of people traipse through Oxford and through Christ Church just to see this hall. We happen to eat our meals there and have our plenary sessions there, which isn't bad. Uh, Mrs. Carlberg and I wish you well in your last year, and we appreciate your words of encouragement and your words of affirmation to us. By the way, this was taken at the closing session of the conference, which was held at Blenheim Palace, the birthplace of Winston Churchill, right outside of Oxford. You can see we were very happy in that, that picture because uh, we had just had three days of mind-expanding discussions and uh, meeting people who were indeed the leaders, the future leaders, and the current leaders of our world. God bless you as you, as you go.